Hello and welcome. I'm Carol Cram, host of the Art and Fiction Podcast. This episode features Nancy Bilyeu, author of several novels listed on Art and Fiction, including Dreamland, The Blue, and The Fugitive Colors in the Visual Arts category, Tapestry in the Textile Arts category, and The Orchid Hour in the Theater category. Born in Chicago and a graduate of the University of Michigan, Nancy Bilyeu moved to New York City to work in the magazine business as a writer and editor. After working for publications ranging from Rolling Stone to Good Housekeeping, she turned to fiction. In her latest novel, The Orchid Hour, Nancy returns to the early 20th century New York City of her novel Dreamland to once again tell a story of suspense revolving around a compelling heroine. Welcome to the Art and Fiction Podcast, Nancy. So great to be here. I'm so happy that you reached out. Yes, well, we met at the Historical Novel Society Conference in San Antonio last year, didn't we? Yeah, that was one of the highlights. Yes, I think you're at one of my presentations. So that was awesome. Yes. Yeah, about art and fiction. You are kind of <laughs> like the poster child for art and fiction. You've written so many <laughs> novels for art features in some kind of form. So we're going to talk, start today uh, talking about The Orchid Hour, which is your latest novel. Mm -hmm. You chose to set this novel in the 1920s. What was it about that era that appealed to you? I know I went closest to our present time with that one. My, my debut yes. novel was in 1537. <laughs> so I've really hurtled into the 20th century. I picked that year and I picked the 1920s because I wanted to tell the story of an, a, a young Italian woman who is thrust into the middle of the crime-ridden prohibition, which, you know, from my research was the launching pad for organized crime. And I wanted to take a look at some of those people, both in my uh, ones I created and real people, like Arnold Rothstein and uh, Lucky Luciano, more on him later. But I wanted to do it through a young woman because I felt like that has rarely been done in these books and movies. They're usually gun malls or they're protected daughters or they're loose living wives. <laughs> and those are all fun stock characters. But I just wanted to really take a look at a uh, closer look at a, a, an Italian American immigrant woman who's in one of these families, but is not herself. Uh, a happy participant in crime. The Italian American community in that period experienced a lot of prejudice. So tell us about that community. Like they were quite recent immigrants, weren't they? Yes. Now I am descended from on my mother's side, the O'Neills, Irish immigrants mm -hmm. into North America. The Italians came a full generation or two later and encountered even harsher prejudice. There was yes. basically open immigration. So they were pouring, pouring in from mostly Southern Italy. And they were, sometimes it was the men coming over alone to make money and send it back. Um, young families coming over, not as much, uh, but there were some. And what was happening is they were living in lower Manhattan, if they were in New York, in tenements, and then hopefully getting out of the tenements and going over to what became Little Italy, but which is still pretty humble housing and starting shops and, and small businesses and working their way up. And, but there was enormous prejudice. And in fact, I did a lot of reading into the eugenics movement, which in the yes, early 20th that. century really was targeting Italians and Jews in their just shocking <laughs> scientific emphasis on the fact that certain people were not fully human. <laughs> And in their intelligence and their and in their physical being. And that was that was the basis they used to actually restrict immigration later in the 20s. But during my period, 1923, immigration is still flooding in. But there's enormous, enormous obstacles toward Italians and Jewish Americans toward taking part in American, to say the least, the American dream, but just being educated and getting good jobs. It's, it was extremely hard. Yes, and you really brought that out, that whole immigrant experience, because she was born in Italy, wasn't she, Zia? Sicily. Sicily. Mm -hmm. And then all of the crime family stuff. How did you research that? You know, it's one of those things I, I kind of go, I, I, I know some writers end up like 
when they come up with a new book to write, they pitch endless concepts to agents and editors and somebody likes something, then they go off and do it. And I always go with what I'm super interested in. And then I pursue that. That's the way it's always worked with me. And I've always been interested in, well, I lived in New York City for many years. And so I was always interested in Little Italy in New York City history. And then I'll admit, I was very much one of those Godfather one and two <laughs> watchers. I've read the Godfather, Mario Puzo's book um, yes. a couple of times. And I just became kind of, if you live in New York City, you are very aware of what it has done to New York City. And you become fascinated by it or just aware of it or hating it, but you know about it. You know about organized crime if you live in New York. And I more and more became interested in the beginning. I'm always wanting to go back because I'm a historical novelist. Of course. You know, what was it like when it first got started? And I found out very rapidly that without prohibition, it wouldn't have started. <laughs> because that elite, you know, making alcohol illegal, but not taking away the enormous thirst for alcohol in society from people with money created a huge market for ambitious people who could come up with good business plans yes. and fill this need and line their pockets and then start to move into political power. And, you know, and from that, we got the mafia in America. Yeah, because yeah, you had a lot of layers in this novel. You had, you had the um, organized crime, you had the police corruption, you had the Italian immigrant experience, and then the actor, David, and the yes. Orchid Hour. Yes, I, I like love David. Oh, I love looking into the actual speakeasies because yes. people think that it's like, have you ever seen the movie Gilda with Rita Hayworth? They think that's what they were like, huge no. nightclubs with huge dance floors and gorgeous. And the fact is they were usually pretty small because you know, they were illegal. And, you know, there are very few nice clubs. But in at the end of 1923, the first swank nightclub, the Cotton Club, opened. Yes. And so that's part of the reason I picked 1923. And so I have my fictional club, The Orchid Hour, which is based on a number of real um, speakeasies and nightclubs opening in the uh, summer of 1923. Because that was the, the beginning of people saying, OK, we can just set up a bar and just pour really cheap alcohol <laughs> into glasses of people. Will, or we can keep them there for a while with entertainment, with a little food with better drinks and cocktails and gin giblets and champagne. And so I was really interested in that, that it, the prohibition gave us so many things. And one of them is the nightclub really took off then. And women going to bars and nightclubs because before prohibition, women did not go to saloons and they no. just didn't even go to establishments where men were drinking. But this is all part of women becoming freer and feeling like they could go out and, you know, cut their hair and dance and, and, you know, hold their own. Well, uh, it was the flapper era. Because Zia yes. actually does cut her hair, doesn't she? She does. And that's a big <laughs> crossing the <laughs> Rubicon a deal. for a woman back then, you know, because there was a lot of condemnation of women cutting their hair from people who felt that that showed lack of, well, morality, lack and, and, and a willingness to sort of shoot out from under the, if you, forgive me, the patriarchy. And um, well, yes, absolutely. Taking your, doing your own thing. <laughs> So it well, was, yeah, we we have a lot that. to thank our great grandmothers for, for our grandmothers. <laughs> I think yeah. my my grandmother was a bit of a flapper. There you, you know, go. She, oh yeah, <laughs> she was quite the babe in her day. <laughs> oh, so, I love to hear this. <laughs> and I was reading on your blog that the location of the Orchid Hour, which is fictional, mm -hmm. but is a real location. Tell us a little bit about how you chose that location. Yes, well, I've always been interested in Greenwich Village yes. history. You know, if you saw the movie Reds uh, with Warren Beatty and Diane Keaton, then you know that it was a bohemian area. Mm -hmm. I always have found that very interesting. If you go there now, there's these cobblestone streets and uh, they're kind of curving. The West Village, Greenwich Village is really not like the rest of the city. It has a little bit of a magical secluded air. And so I thought, you know, a lot of the nightclubs were in Times Square or there with the Cotton Club, they're farther north. But there were a couple of that were way down there that catered more to the you know, the, this new magazine called The New Yorker and writers all wanted to go to a speakeasy. So they were catering to the writers and the actors and the uh, artsy people. So there's these streets in, and maybe they have them in other older cities in North America where they, they're called Muse. 
and they were once where you had stables. And then once you didn't have horses anymore, you still had this sort of structure where the, the stables are sort of facing these almost like cobblestone alleys. And so many times those, those mews be, were converted into artists' residencies, you know, mm-hmm. and, and places where sort of the more adventurous, progressive people wanted to live and have their studios. There were, there were some famous ones like Gertrude Vanderbilt, and she had a studio in the same area. So it was seen a place to have your, your artists, your, your place where you could have your models come and paint them. And, and then you sometimes, I mean, I'm sure Gertrude didn't, but some of them lived there then <laughs> as well. Yeah. Yeah, so I probably get, she would. Yeah, I think she had an uptown mansion. <laughs> so I wanted to get that kind of magical, bohemian, secret garden almost type of feel. And since there was in reality a lot of, yeah. and I've been to one, which was like almost a, a beauty parlor where you would go through and have a password and then go through to the back. There was another one where you had to push past a bookshelf and get in. I mean, it, it was fun. And so for mine, it was a florist. And yes. you go through the florist and you give a password and then you go into the nightclub. And uh, uh, even now, you know, with, with nightlife, there's that sense of what's the magic word. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I think it started then with what, you know, you couldn't write about them in the newspaper because they're illegal. So it was all word of mouth. Like, what's the new place to go? And what's the yeah. magic word? And who will you see there? And will, you know, Mary Pickford or her brother be there? And, you know, what kind of jazz will we hear? So it would be that kind of excitement. It was, yeah. must have been. Let's it go. must have been a very interesting period for sure. And then there was always that little frisson of danger that they could get raided at any time, right? By the yes. cops. But well, then the, the cops, cops were kind of corrupt. So what happened was New York City very reluctantly went dry, very reluctantly. And in fact, there was a lot of denial right up to the minute it happened. This won't happen. <laughs> and so what happened was there was um, a widespread feeling among the police that we have more important things to do. Yeah. Yes. And so that we we have real crimes to uh, try to stop. And also the judges were like, I can't have my courtroom overrun with um, embarrassed dads who had a drink at a speakeasy. You know, I, I can't mm-hmm. get to the real cases. And so there was this sort of this attitude of like, we're not really going to enforce this. And it would wax and wane because then, you know, there'd be some outrage. Why is there all these nightclubs everywhere? And then the police would be, okay, let's throw a few padlocks on <laughs> and then it would go back to let's look the other way because who cares you know but yeah but what happened is that to supply the alcohol you had to deal with organized crime and so they were the investors in the clubs they were the suppliers of the clubs and they were the customers of the club and the booze <laughs> all came from canada a lot of it did yeah. and i just love that story that i and i, I couldn't resist uh, and just using it as a snippet, there was one one man who started a speakeasy. And what happened was he was driving a taxi right after Prohibition started. And some frantic man flagged him down and said, I will give you this money if you will drive this taxi to Montreal. Wow. <laughs> and he's a long way. Okay, if you'll give me like, you know, whatever. At the time, maybe it was like $100, which would have been a, yeah. a lot of money. And once they got up there, this guy just bought a lot of alcohol to bring back. And so the cab driver thought, I'm on to something. And so he bought some too. And he eventually ended up being having some really nice clubs. So I was intrigued by why you called the club the Orchid Hour. Why orchids? Because they were seen as the flowers of the wealthy. You know, mm-hmm. in The Great Gatsby, Daisy loves orchids. Very rich girls love them. And you could not grow them from seeds yet. They hadn't conquered that quite yet. So you were importing them. So they were very wow. expensive. Yeah. I found out that there is an orchid that in, I think, Bolivia that, you know, because the orchids cater to the uh, insects and there was insects that were nocturnal and they fed this particular orchid species. So the orchid would open up in the middle of the night and that's when it would bloom to get that nocturnal insect to pollinate. And so people did bring that particular orchid. It was very expensive. They'd go into the jungles and they'd uproot it and bring it back to the United States. And and so I thought that a very demanding, you know, fanciful person who really wanted his club to be amazing would glom onto that. I'm going to have an orchid that blooms only at night. And so that's what I had my, Dave and my nightclub host and sort of 
brain brain trust for the orchid hour. That was his concept. But as you saw in the book, it doesn't it doesn't really go that way. <laughs> it's not so easy. <laughs> no, not at all. No, it, but it was it was a brilliant metaphor though for or the orchid for the that period oh, and for the novel as well. I really liked it. You could spend a lot of time thinking about that use of the orchid as a metaphor for a lot of the themes in the novel. So what would you say are some of the themes in the novel? I think one of the main themes for my main character, Zia, is finding her own agency, finding freedom Yes, from being purely a wife, daughter, mother, but at what price? Getting to make choices will you make the right choices? So that is a theme of her awakening and her embracing a new life. But with it came a lot of uh, danger because she really, you know, storms right into a pretty dangerous situation, thinking that she can control it because she is related to one of the investors of the club. Yeah, of course, she didn't know he was a mobster. No. Her, her, well, her cousin. Yeah. Yeah, another another myth I wanted to dispel is there's, it's funny because the novel The Godfather has the family the, the Corleones very even in the opening with the wedding they're very open and very proud of who they are that they yeah. control the the East Coast mafia they're the most prominent of the families and in reality even in the seventies there was a little bit more secrecy because of police and FBI and definitely in the twenties and thirties. Families were not all proud of this at all. And in fact, in my book, Salvatore Lucania, whose street name was Lucky Luciano, seen as like the father of organized crime, his own father disowned him and hated the fact that his son was a criminal. And one of the reasons that in an interview, and he didn't give many, I mean, that's just until John Gotti, most of these guys did stayed away from the, the uh, media. But he did tell one person the reason he never had children himself is that he didn't want to have a son who would say my father was a crook. So even he, who 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 was a very successful crook, huh. had mixed feelings about it, and there was some shame, you know. And so there was actually a lot of shame among the the Jewish and the Italian mafia among the extended families. It's not, I mean, when you get into the seventies and the eighties and Goodfellas and Godfather, people have this image of and Gaudis are doing you know reality TV shows that they're all super proud. But they're not super proud when they're getting life sentences. <laughs> exactly. You know, the mafia was pretty much dismantled in the 80s and 90s because of wiretapping and RICO and so forth. But uh, but I, what I wanted to show in my book was that, uh, you know, not all Italians were criminals. And I mean, they, no. it was a very sore point with them even today the, about the image. And, you know, they accepted that, that some of the members of their families would get into this because it was a way to make money when there weren't other... And, it, ways to make money besides being a laborer and if you wanted to live in the plaza hotel which is what he wanted to do and have beautiful suits and go to great boxing matches and have the most beautiful girlfriends and travel the world you'd you pretty much had to be a crook i mean that's just the reality in, in the 1920s if you were from his background but, you know he didn't even finish high school so he had no education so families knew this but they were still ashamed you know, well, I think you brought that up very well, how moral the family unit was, you know, mm -hmm. these people, they were kind of down to earth people that had emigrated for a better life. And exactly. And they were right. shocked by that kind of thing. I mean, she was yeah. shocked to find that <laughs> out. <Yeah. laughs> so, uh, Nancy, would you like to do a reading from the Orchid Hour? Sure, sure. Here. So this is from a chapter that's about one fourth of the way in. And it is when my character, Zia, has gone to her brother's for her birthday party. And her brother is a laborer who lives in the Bronx. Now, Salvatore, who is her cousin, she's very fond of, was invited, but no one expects him to be there. So he shows up. <laughs> so here's how it begins. My cousin, Salv my cousin Salvatore stood in the corner between the olive green drapes and a painting of St. Agatha, bringer of miracles. I hadn't heard Sal come in, and I had no idea how long he'd been listening. Hey, Kachina, he said, holding up his hands, rippling his fingers as if playing the piano, though as far as I knew, Sal had never played the piano or any musical instrument. Welcome, said my brother Massimo, rising to greet Sal as host. Standing face to face, shaking hands, they were the exact same height. While both were black-haired and brown-eyed, how unlike the cousins were. It wasn't just that Sal was younger. He was sleeker. His hair gleamed, and his white shirt peeking under his jacket glowed. 
He wore some crazy blue tie with swirls on it. I knew without even looking that my in-laws must be upset that Sal had shown up, but it was my uncle Antonio, Sal's father, who spoke. Why'd you give them our address, he demanded. They came to the apartment two weeks ago. Please don't start, his wife Ros Rosalia pleaded. He waved her off. Who, Papa? asked Sal, perfectly calm. Who came? You know who, the police. Precinct said you gave them our address as yours and you haven't lived with your mother and me for years. At the word police, a ripple of unease made its way around the dinner table. No one in this room wanted anything to do with the New York City police. They specialized in giving Italians a hard time. Sal shrugged. Ah, oh, that's nothing. The cops wanted to ask me about the activities of some man. I don't know him. Don't give it another thought. Don't give it another thought, his father roared. They come in showing their badges. They look down on us. They scared your mother to death. Rosalia could no longer contain herself and shouted, they don't scare me. You're just saying that. Let Sal sit down. He just walked in the door. His face beat red. Antonio retorted, I wish he'd walk out the door. Rosalia, overcome, took out her handkerchief. Through it all, Sal didn't flinch. He might as well have been talking about lost laundry. But when his mother's eyes filled with tears, he said to Massimo, I'll leave my gift for Zia and I'll just go. My brother smiled uncomfortably. Yeah, okay, probably best, Salvatore. Even now, Uncle Antonio wouldn't let go. That's not his name. Haven't you heard? He goes by Charles Lucania now. No one spoke up for Sal. I pushed back my chair and rising said, I'll walk you to your car. Zia. It was a woman's voice, reproachful. I wasn't sure who it was, and I didn't stay to find out. I left with Sal, closing the door behind us on the street. There was at least an hour of daylight left. I just wanted to get a closer look at this, I said, tugging his tie. What is this? Swirls? You've come to this? It's a new style, which you would know if style meant anything to you, he said, laughing at me. On the sidewalk, glancing back at Massimo's house, I said, I thought your father was calming down in his old age. Nope. Even if he's on his deathbed, he's still going to be yelling at me. I felt a, ga a stab of guilt at my birthday party was the cause of Sal colliding with his father. I said, you know, another thing is everybody's been drinking a lot of wine and maybe they're not so used to it. Yeah, that Amarone is a top vintage. I asked, how would you know what we're drinking? I stopped on the sidewalk. Oh, the wine came from you. Yeah, Massimo got in touch. This wasn't the best news. Sal, listen, you're not a bootlegger, right? I heard a bad story from Mr. Sylvia at the store. In South Jersey, some bootleggers held up his truck full of mozzarella, thinking it was whiskey coming up from Atlantic City. It got rough. Me, he said? Shake down a cheese truck? I don't think so. No, Zia, I just made a call about the Amarone. I just know some people. Really? I pulled on my cousin's arm to make him stop walking. Tell me what's going on. You're telling me the truth. You're a gambler. And that's it, right? Nothing else. No rough stuff. No rough stuff. My 26-year-old cousin looked me straight in the eye. Beneath the flashy clothes and the brilliant teen hair cream and the smooth moves, I saw the eight-year-old boy I crossed the Atlantic Ocean with. That boy had never lied to me, just as I had never lied to him. He said, in fact, I got a business deal to celebrate, Zia. We could have raised a glass of Amarone to celebrate in Massimo's house. I got a nightclub opening up soon. It's going to be special. It's going to make us famous. You'll be hearing the name soon. It's the Orchid Hour. <laughs> that's fantastic. Thank you. So that's the first time she hears those words. <laughs> the Orchid and Hour, the yes. And then it's going to play such a great role. Thank you. You must have a lot of fun writing that novel, actually. Oh, cause... I did. I really enjoyed <laughs> it. And I had to work hard on my dialogue because I didn't want it to be, you know, obvious thug like talk cliche dens and does but uh <laughs> i can't have them talking like shakespearean actors either oh. so you know i sort of workshopped it with friends and really did a lot of research actually when you look at some of the interviews that are uh transcripts with with criminals mm -hmm. at the time you can't use it you can barely understand what they're saying you know the, the grammar and everything and if i used it then oh. it would look like i'm making fun of them you know what i mean it's yeah. hard to figure out how to convey authenticity without stopping the reader thinking you're making them sound like morons and there was also less slang back then that we don't use and i don't yeah. like to put a lot of slang in because even though it, it could be fun and it definitely gives an authentic historical cred it's distracting 
You know, I want people to like go with the characters in the story and just keep hurtling along instead of like going to the Wikipedia. No, you, de you definitely don't want to do that or do it phonetically or stuff like that. That's, right, that's right, not right, great. Right. Don't want that. I actually listened to your book on an audio book. Oh. And they did really great accents. They, oh, they sounded yeah. she very good. New York, very sort of gangster like. Yeah, they, it was good, actually. We had a number of people who actually took it too far and they sounded like, you know, as I said, somebody from the show Jersey Shore. And then on the yeah. other side, had somebody who sounded like Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> you know, we wanted somebody in between, you know. Well, it worked because it was just enough oh, I'm to glad. get that flavor. Yeah. It, it felt very yeah. New York, but without, yeah, it didn't go overboard. It was good. I, I really enjoyed the audio book. Oh, bug. wonderful. Not all audio books are created equal, right? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so I also want to talk briefly about The Fugitive Colors, which is set in a very different era. So yeah. tell us a little bit about this novel. Well, it's a follow-up to The Blue, which was yes. one of my, I think, my second most successful books. It was a more of a personal book as far as my family in that on my father's side, the Bill you name is a French Huguenot name. Oh, uh, interesting. Is, uh, yeah, Protestants who settled in North America and they came to what is then New Amsterdam, now New York City in 1665, uh, Pierre, Bill you. And um, I so had my book set in Europe. So I, I researched uh, East London, Spitalfields, is the site of a major Huguenot community and a lot of silk weavers, a lot of, I wouldn't say fine artists, not that many, but a few, but silversmiths, yeah. you know, people who have a lot of talent and use their talent in their trade, you know, but not, not exactly fine artists. So I came up with a, a Huguenot family. I wanted to tell this story, I wanted to do a spy story, <laughs> female artist, spy and she's the main character jean via planchet of the blue and then the blue did well and people wanted to what's next so yeah. i wrote the fugitive colors which is you know and people who know art know that i didn't know this till i researched it that joshua reynolds who was a very important artist in mid 18th century england he had some trouble with his pigments and some of his works even now they did really bad fading and crackling mm -hmm. And so they called his colors the fugitive colors <laughs> because they didn't stand up. He was trying so hard for original shades and to really capture human skin and background, just really going for a lustrous look in his portraits. He did all portraits. Yes. But sometimes he would he would cut some corners. I mean, you just didn't have the knowledge that the people have now about how to have <laughs> the right pigment for your for your oils. So the Fugitive Colors is just one of the, the little themes and things in the book, along with, like I said, spying and life in London, a marriage that's under some strain. So I was just working with a lot of those different things to tell another suspenseful story. I got to plunge into Covent Garden, you know, where most of the, <laughs> almost every woman is a prostitute, you know, yes. it's kind of, a, but you have the whole Samuel Johnson and, you know, all of the really exciting writers, thinkers. There were some women artists just starting. Yes. Uh, the big obstacle with women artists was that it was absolutely not allowed for women to do nudes. So they couldn't yes. really get into the anatomy. They couldn't have formal training. They were often the wives or daughters of mm -hmm. male artists. I, I was very interested in the fact that women had a hard time <laughs> yeah, for, for the reasons that you had to have so much training you yeah. had to like do the history painting and enormous amounts of anatomy and enormous amounts of scenery training. And there wasn't the personal expression <laughs> that you have now. And a great many of them ended up, which you brought out in the book, uh, doing uh, still lifes. Yes. Right? I've just lately discovered all of these female painters who specialized in still lifes, particularly the, right. the Flemish ones like Rachel. Ryan. Oh, I loved her. I was just in Europe a few months ago, and and every time we went to a museum, go, oh, there's a woman, there's a woman, and there's yeah. way more than there used to be. They're finally, yes. they're being you know, dragging them out of attics and realizing, yeah. yes, there were quite a few. But you pointed out in the book too that the the reason they did still lifes is because they weren't allowed to do anything else. No, uh, a lot of the time, very difficult. You know. My in the blue, my character idolizes Hogarth and would love nothing yes. better. And to be almost like a social satirist and capture New York, you yes. know, with her art. And that was just not possible yet. 
Although, you know, it, it would be eventually. She's ahead of her time. Yes, yes, she was very much. Yeah, no, I, I, I like that that part in there because actually I've been thinking about writing a novel about a woman still life painter you know oh, based on great. all of the amazing yeah. paintings I saw particularly in in Amsterdam on my last trip oh wow. and I brought this I bought this huge book that's all female painters of still life it's in Dutch <laughs> detail. Oh. but the pictures are in are, are regular so yeah, but yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by that. I just love the detail that these women would get, you know, in the in the still lifes of that period. So I was quite inspired when I was reading your book. I'm like, oh, maybe I should do that. <laughs> oh, definitely, I, I go for it. Yeah, right <laughs> so one of my goals in the art and fiction podcast is to inspire other authors. So what's one thing you've learned from writing historical fiction that you didn't know before you started? Well. I didn't know before I started that I could actually draw on, and people shouldn't be hesitant to do this, draw on things that they're very interested in, little bits of history, and weave them into your own book. And I really yes. do think that if there's a theme in me, that's it. We're like, and I don't want to be corny and say, follow your bliss, but follow <laughs> your own interests and try to weave them in because just your enthusiasm and and and, and your excitement will go a long way in sort of concocting an immersive world, you know, that people will want to spend time in. So, you know, I, I, online, I probably spend way too much time doing this. I'll just see people uh, talking about the trends all the time. Is World War II still big? Should I do this? Oh, yeah. I do that? And you just, you just can't do that because it's so competitive. It's so difficult. And believe me, it goes slow too. You'll sell a book and it'll have to be edited. It won't be out for another year or two. So you know, you might as well do something that you're really drawn to. But at the yeah. same time, it's very important to think about pace. It's very important to think about uh, a character that, that people will, they don't have to like them a lot, but they have to care about what happens next. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of key. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And, and but those things can all be worked on in, in, in workshops and beta readers. And, you know, I have the problem where sometimes when I'm writing something, what's very clear to me I think I've really done it. <laughs> and then I have one woman who's like a, a really wonderful friend who's a beta reader. And sometimes I'll I'll find out from her because she's very honest, like, well, I didn't get that. <laughs> yeah. So like there's this little distance between what I think I've done and what someone coming in is getting. And I need to move those closer. <laughs> yes. That's super important for someone to to think about because it's really easy to, especially if you revise it over and over again and you're way inside it. Yes. You know, yeah. It's your thing. own little world that yeah. you've created. And what do you mean other people don't get it? Yeah. <laughs> that's that's the importance of beta readers as well. So historical fiction, of course, relies on an incredible amount of research. What's some advice to authors about research methods? I try to use as many books, novels, sometimes written at the time yeah. that my book takes place. You know, so for instance, Tom Jones takes place during the time of the Fugitive Colors and to sort of get the rhythm I'll read mm. that and it'll get me inspired, you know, to uh, capture that. As far as research goes, I find that I have to research a lot in the beginning. And some people say, oh, I I research, I read a couple books and then I set up my plot and then I fill it in as I go. The problem I mm. have with that is that since I write very atmospheric, immersive fiction, I don't know literally how to get someone from point A to point B unless I've researched how they would do it. And in that research, I may find things that will then trigger plot. So for me, research is super important to do in the beginning to know how, you know, how people will get around, how they'll react, how they will live. And that, yeah, it sparks plot, big reveals, twists, and so forth. So I think that, you know, sometimes, and I don't blame them, people are in a hurry to get going. And so what you end up with is a lot of dialogue that could take place almost in any time, but they'll put yes. in some costumes that stuff where you know I like to have my people in motion yeah you know um actually doing things and you really can't do that until you've done the research to find out what people would do you know I can't tell you how many times I've had to go back to say okay what's the difference between a hackney carriage and a coach and a this and a that <laughs> in the 18th century but it makes a difference 
you know, it, as to yeah, how that's excellent advice. Yeah, that yeah, I can actually taking that to heart myself. That's uh, how long do you do the research phase, approximately? I should go longer. Like I know one of your previous guests uh, who wrote uh, Bronte's Mistress. Mm -hmm. I think she researched for at least a year solid before she started writing, and I don't do that. Mm -hmm. I will try to research intensely for a, at least two months before I get started. I wish I could go longer, but often I kind of have to get going. But also yeah. what happens is I'm eager to get going. But I'm one of those people who redoes their first chapter about a thousand times, you know, even though they yeah, say, me too. just write one rough draft, don't stop. I can't do it. I, I can't do that either. I, I wish it. I could. I've tried. I really have given it a shot. I, myself, I know I think I should just go, okay, for two months, I'm not going to do any writing. I'm not even going to think about the story. I'm just going to research the period. I don't do that, but I should, because I think it would be better. <laughs> just hard. just from what you were saying as well. Yeah, because you know? the scenes start to, you know, for me, it's almost like a, a movie going on in my head and yeah. the people start to talk and they start to move. And I almost don't want to mm -hmm. lose that, you know, that excitement, and the inspiration. So I'll just start going. You know, and then I'll do spot research as I go. What are you working on now, Nancy? Right now, I'm working on the next book in the Jean of Jean Via Planche series. Um, oh, great! The title is the Versailles Formula, so it is sort of plunging back into spying, plunging back into the rivalry between France and England, and uh, Genevieve is uh, taking a a dangerous task to try and get information for the British this time about some things that are going on in France. And as you know, Sev Porcelain was made in Versailles. So that's where I will leave it. <laughs> so is the he series going to be ended with three novels or do you think you're going to go? I don't know. I thought I was ending with one. And then my publisher said, how about a second one? And they said, people like series. How about a that's third? True. I don't see this turning into a, you know, a Louise Penny thing where I'm going to have 10, 15. I don't see that coming. But it is fun to go back with the same main characters and also having some familiarity, you know, so like, so I don't have to do all of the research from scratch, which I've done standalones and series. And, you know, I love standalones, but they are a lot of work when you're going to a new time and place. So that's for sure. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, that, that's actually really wonderful that you're doing a series with that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Female artist spy series. Ge Genevieve is very appealing. I really like her. Oh, good. She's she's a good character, is Genevieve. She's oh, I enjoy kind of writing wanna, her. If you're going to have a series, the main thing is you got to have a good main character. Yes. People yes. are going to care about. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to want to go along. <laughs> yeah, no easy matter. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Nancy. It's been so much fun chatting with you. Well, this has been great. I really enjoyed talking to you about my work. This is a real treat. Good. Well, thank you. I've been speaking with Nancy Billieu, author of several novels listed on art and fiction, including The Orchid Hour, listed in the theater category at www.artandfiction.com. Be sure to check the show notes for a link to Nancy's website at www.nancybillieu.com. You'll also find a link to a 20% discount on a subscription to Pro Writing Aid, a fantastic editing tool for writers. If you are enjoying the Art and Fiction podcast, please help us keep the lights on by donating a coffee on the Ko-fi website. The link is in the show notes. Also, please follow Art and Fiction on X and Facebook. And don't forget to subscribe to Art and Fiction on YouTube and give the Art and Fiction podcast a positive review or rating wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks so much for listening. Mm -hmm.